recording. So good evening. Tonight I want to talk about EDKA. The reason I'm talking about this, and I've made this lecture now for a few different groups, is very simple. I had a, a very close relative who was now feeling well for a number of days. Um, and turns out all this I'm going to present now is a, pretty much a case study on what we found and what happened. And I think every EMT should be familiar with this. So EDKA, DKA is a common hyperglycemic problem. Uh, well, I'll mention that very quickly in the, in the lecture. Um, euglycemic DKA is where the sugar level stays low or normal. So EU is used a lot in medicine to mean normal level. Um, the not hyper, not hypo, euglycemic, which means that the patient could have somewhat of a normal um, blood glucose reading. Now, if you go to the literature, when you look up DKA, they pretty much all say that the patient will be between 250 and 500, because these are the numbers that we can see on our machines. 250 and 500. And usually they're in the 500 plus range, but that is the number that's given in the literature. So here we have a patient who is a type two diabetic and he has become very, very sick. Um, fatigue has become one of the number one symptoms. And I'm going to explain how this all pans out and what this is, this euglycemic DKA. So it's a very different type and you're gonna see it um, and I'll explain why this is going to be prevalent. All right. So uh, signs and symptoms will be on a you know case by case basis. However, what I wrote here is that it'll be without the polyuria, polydipsia. Two of the main symptoms of hyperglycemia are polyuria, polydipsia. Polydipsia is much thirst and drinking, constant drinking and thirst. Polyuria is much urination. And this is a normal, normal thing that you'll see with patients who are hyperglycemic. And whether they're in DKA or not is a whole different story. But these are the typical, typical symptoms that you will see. Now, EDKA patients can present with nausea, vomiting, shortness of breath, generalized malaise, which just means feeling lousy, sick lethargy, loss of appetite, and fatigue or abdominal pain. My patient had fatigue, loss of appetite, um, and general malaise. So we have some of these symptoms here. Uh, they may not have polyuria, polydipsia, and my patient did not, okay? Why? Why don't you have polyuria, polydipsia? These come from elevated levels of glucose. Now, if there is no elevation in the glucose and we're not dealing with the five, 600 range, then you're not gonna get these two symptoms. So um, dehydration, definitely something that plays a part here. Um, and then may or may not be Stresses like pregnancy, surgery, um, infections, alcohol, stuff like that. So it's very, very vague right now, uh, the symptoms that I've given you. Remember, this will be with normal blood glucose readings. Now, they may have Cosmo respirations. Uh, the reason that DKA patients have Cosmo respirations is because there is too much acid uh, from the ketones in the body, and I'll explain that a little bit soon. 
And that's why trying to blow it off because the body sees the CO2 as acid and the body will try to blow it off any which way it can. And that's where the whole Kuzmo respirations come from when we talk about regular DKA. Um, they may have the fruity odor in their breath, okay? Um, tachycardia, which means fast heart rate, which my patient had. Hypotension, did not have. Altermentation, no. Increased skin turgor and delayed cat refill. These are typically signs of uh, dehydration or metabolic shock, and I did not see that. Several cases, severe dehydration, metabolic demand lead to hypovolemic shock, lethargy, and, and this. So basically, it's still very vague um, as to what is going on with this with these patients. Very vague. Um, usually, they recover well if you able to diagnose it and get them to a good ER. Uh, I took my patient to NYU, um, and they give insulin, dextrose, and they do all sorts of stuff to um, level things out. Prognosis is worse for small children, pregnant women, um, but rarely severe case of respiratory failure, et cetera, common death. Uh, death is rare in most EDKA, however, pregnant women have greater mortality risk than the general population. So these are all things that we may need to keep in mind. All right, here's your regular DKA. This is a review of stuff you should know. DKA, diabetic, ketoacidase, acidosis. One of the three things, and they come together, right? So it starts with hyperglycemia, very, very high levels of blood glucose, like I said, over 250. Ketosis is the um, body breaking down fats and producing sugar because it can't get inside the cell, so this will get inside the cell. The backup bad byproduct is ketones, and this causes ketosis. I know there's a famous diet that people talk about, but I, I wouldn't go anywhere near it. In general, ketosis is a bad thing. And then there's acidosis. Acidosis is called by the ketones, um, and the ketones being produced by the cells uh, are acidic and therefore cause the Kuzmo respirations, et cetera. So this is just a review on stuff that uh, you should be familiar with. All right, so here is the culprit um, uh, for my patient and for many, many patients, okay? Um, and this is a new-ish medication, Jardians, and you need to check if your patient is taking this or any other medication that falls into the SGLT2 community, all right? It's a group of medications. This one is the most common one, the most famous one. And if you read up on this drug, it says that one of the side effects is DKA. So here you have a patient who is trying to take control of their sugar. They have type 2 diabetes. And their doctor put them on Jardians. And all of a sudden, we've now got a situation where this patient got to get to an ICU um, and we got to get him checked out. So this is the name of the drug. This is the drug that my patient had recently started taking. So here's a little bit about it. This is the other name, Empire Leave. Yeah, you can read it. Um, and this is who makes it. So it's an SGLT2. Very simple. Sodium glucose transporter. And it's type 2 inhibitor. So it inhibits sodium glucose transport. 
uh, reduces renal tubular glucose reabsorption, uh, decreasing blood glucose level without stimulating insulin release. So it's new technology. It's a great drug. And it helps people who are diabetics. Great. The problem is, we're going to see, recent data show that these inhibitors, particularly jar, jar DNs, carry the risk of inducing e glycemic DKA under certain circumstances, such as acute illness, so if they got sick, right? Decreased carbohydrate intake. What is the first thing every diabetic is told? No carbohydrates. And my patient had been on a pretty much zero carbohydrate intake diet. All right. Um, so here they have a case of a 23-year-old female. Mine was a 75-year-old patient, but male, but poorly controlled DN, diabetes mellitus, on this Johnians who presented with dyspnea, coronavirus, so it's a little while ago, um, and found to have severe unexplained EDKA with elevated urine ketones. So basically, there are two things that you're going to see um, primarily. Number one will be the acetone odor on their breath. You will still smell the acetone from the ketones, okay? Acetone, you probably know, is the smell of nail polish remover, and that can be smelled on their breath. The other one will be something we cannot do in the field, and that is to check the urine. So I got my patient to a local physician. The physician smelled the breath, checked the urine, and called me right away and said, get him to NYU because he is in DKA. He didn't say it was U, glycemic DKA. He just called it DKA. I said, how's that possible? His sugar was 140. I tested it myself. He said, I test, did you, he said to me, did you test the urine? I said, no, I don't have the capability of testing for ketones in the urine. Um, and yeah, that's, that was the bottom line. Um, he, uh, we took him, um, type two diabetic. I told you had the, the fatigue, the lethargy, um, some of these um, symptoms that I spoke about. And with that uh, SGLT2 inhibitor uh, and no carbohydrate intake, went into EDKA. Um, I uh, brought the patient in. I presented the case to the hospital at NYU. Nurse thought I was out of my mind or from a you know a different planet because how could it be at 140? What are you talking about? You know, you crazy paramedic. Uh, 140 is not DKA. Told them this is EDKA. This is a different type, and he's going to need to get uh, ICU treatment. Um, they ran some bloods and. Kahava, that's what it was. It was EDKA. And the patient yeah, was in hospital for about a week to get things um, to get things back to normal. And um and Barksham, you know, made a made a, a full recovery. Um, but again, it's 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 difficult because we don't have a way to check the urine for ketones. All right, children with special health care needs. Um, this is actually a real acronym in medicine, CSHCN. Uh, now you know what it means. 
Um, there are many different issues that, you know, can be found physical, developmental, behavioral, emotional, and we'll try to go through many of these tonight. Um, yeah, so this is very old, very old statistics. Um, so it was only 12 million in 1994. We're almost 20 years later. Um, so I wouldn't pay any attention to the statistics. Okay. Um, realities, um, we have um, parents that are forced to provide advanced care. It's amazing how when you go to some of these kids, the parents are so, uh, let's say, on the ball. They're just so good at dealing with their children and managing these severe um, and difficult health care needs. Family-centered care because people want to keep these kids at home uh, and not sending them off to institutions. Um, the technology that is available today is completely, um, I mean, it's better than it was 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago. So different equipment, different things you'll see. Um, we'll be feeding catheters, colostomies, pacemakers, glucometers, nebulizers, and apnea monitors. You see all these sort of things, tracheostomies ventilators, BiPAP, which is similar to CPAP, just a little bit different, uh, central venous catheters, um, CSF shunts and vagal nerve stimulators. I've seen kids with all of these uh, types of things. So they're very difficult to manage and don't come in like, you know, oh, I'm the big shot EMT here. And I'm going to tell you. No, be advised by the caregivers, by the parents. Um, they actually know and know how to deal with very well. So we're starting with pulmonary disorders and airway problems. Um, unfortunately, the, a lot of these children have uh, a lot of apnea, which means not breathing, okay, or difficulty breathing. Um, so this can be very worrisome. Make sure you have the right size BVM, et cetera. Uh, there can be many causes. Usually it's some sort of obstruction. Um, cystic fibrosis, which is a disease. Uh, again, I wouldn't worry about the numbers. This is mucus builds up in the lungs. They can't get rid of it because they don't have the muscle strength to actually remove the, the mucus, um, they breathe fast, okay? And um, they need a lot of oxygen and they can go pale or cyanotic. Obviously pale will be white, cyanotic blue and much worse situation. Um, very often, uh, they have drains that help them to get rid of this mucus. They may be on antibiotics and they may be on bronchodilators to widen um, the bronchioles. Cardiovascular deficits, all right? So we have two types, okay? Acyanotic and cyanotic. So one means without cyanosis, and the other one is with cyanosis. So acyanotic heart, heart de deficits, uh, most of the, these problems in children, basically what happens is that the non-oxygenated blood mixes with the oxygenated blood. Saturation would be in the normal range, and they can have septal heart deficits and incomplete heart development. Uh, acyanotic, uh, increased respiratory rate, increased heart rate, everything speeds up, heart murmur and heart failure. Could be rails, uh, swollen extremities. Mm -hmm. 
most common is the ventral septal deficit, uh, and that's the wall here that separates the right from the left. Normally, we know we have the atria and the ventricles, and they do not mix down here. All right. Um, this is the most common, the, H, the ventricle one. There could be a hole up here in the atrial septal. Um, this is uh, what's very famous, patent ductus arteriosus. Uh, this is when a kid is born and they see it's blue after a few days. Um, so the, um, the hole in the heart, if you like, doesn't close. And that's called a PDA, and that can be fixed today. All right, cyanotic heart defects, I put in blue. Um, so oxygen saturation will be low, 70 to 90, right? Palliative procedures may often be performed at birth. Medical may advise you to avoid administration of O2 unless it's, you know, never withhold O2. Uh, obviously, if they have an O2 sub 96, then you're good. But if they're in the low range, 70 to 90, give oxygen. Sign symptoms, number one is cyanosis, increased respiratory rate, increased heart rate, which we saw before with the acyanotic. Poor perfusion, right? And they're not going to perfuse well. Diminished peripheral pulses, like radial pulses, things like that. Uh, poor feeding, sweating. So here we have, um, this could be, some of these could be a whole lecture, you know, a cardiology lecture. Uh, tetralogy of phala is very, very interesting, um, but I'm not going to go into it tonight. So um, hypoplastic left heart syndrome, I know a kid that has that. Uh, transportation of the great art, transposition. That means that the, the, the atrium and the vena cava are split. The, you know, they're in the wrong places. Uh, tricuspid, pulmonary, drusia. Yeah, I'm not going to go into it. cardiac arrhythmia. It's very common. But basically, these are really bad, okay? All right, Down syndrome. It's an abnormality in the chromosome. Um, high risk. They have large tongues, short necks, sometimes obesity, short status, short in height, loose ligaments. Okay, so these would be things that you may see with Down syndrome. Uh, conditions will be the cyanotic. Problems. So this is a ventri ventricle septal deficit or an atrial septal deficit. AV canals is where the bloods are getting mixed. Um, orthopedic, they have a lot of problems with their bones. Um, epilepsy, and obviously they have speech abnormalities. Um, trauma, we always say this, that trauma is the leading cause of death in children. Uh, traumatic brain injuries, TBIs, seizures, CSF, leaking. I mean, you, you're familiar with all this stuff. Spinal cord injury, um, they can have difficulty maintaining body temperature. Um, a disabled child may be unaware that they've been hurt and abused. Neurologic diseases, seizures, epilepsy, TBI. Right, genetic metabolic deficit, congenital brain abnormality, uh, and tumors. These are all cause uh, seizures. Generalized seizures, absent seizures, myoclonic. Um, I'll, I'll try to tell you a story at the end. Remind me. Um, so these are your seizures. Partial, simple partial is one part of the brain. Uh, complex partial, usually unresponsive, and psychomotor partial, repetitive fine motor activity. Um, I've seen the, all of these and um, sometimes very difficult to figure out. Management of seizures, well, 
you know, mom may have uh, valium per rectum. Um, you are allowed to give in New York State, New York City. So we have changed this since whenever the slide was made. Um, so yeah, you are allowed to provide Valium if the caregiver has it. Hydrocephalus, you'll see this every so often, uh, too much CSF build up, and then they put in shunts to move the CSF and get it out of the way. Um, shunts, um, there are two types basically, uh, but I wouldn't really worry about them too much. Just know that if you see a kid with a pipe coming out of their head, that's probably hydrocephalus and probably a shunt. Developmental delay, right? This is always the problem, special ed, stuff like that. We're not dealing with that. Spina bifida. Um, the spinal cord doesn't fuse properly. Um, and then it depends where the problem is. It could be bladder, it could be hydrocephalus in the brain. It could be all sort of all sorts of things. CP, cerebral palsy. Um, many are intellectually intellectual disability, have intellectual disability. Um, it's a damage to the brain center, muscle control problems, things, you know, like this. So many are in wheelchairs or have walkers or whatever. Hematology and oncology, sickle cell anemia, um, usually not by Eden. Um, so, but I, I've seen this in 911 or when I was working in the, in the hospital. Hemophilia is a hereditary disorder, uh, uh, clotting factor that is missing. Um, bleeding, bleeding doesn't stop because they're missing the clotting factor. So even a small bleed can be serious. Musculoskeletal, um, you have all sorts of things like this. Um, brittle bone, um, Bones fracture easily. Looks like this kid has both legs and calves. So uh, always the head is too big for the body and they break a lot of bones. Muscular dystrophy. Um, this is a muscle protein that's missing, um, usually inherited, a uh, problem with motor skills. So tips, well, first of all, obviously look for medical alert patient. They may have such a bracelet or a necklace or something to help you, you know, what, what you should be doing. Um, manage ABCs, obviously the best you can. Um, why do the caregivers call 911? So that's a great question, right? Um, So here are the answers, home health care equipment fails. So you may or may not know how to fix it. Caregivers panic, as we've seen a lot. Uh, they did whatever they were supposed to and the, didn't help. And the child becomes into respiratory cardiac arrest. So there are reasons for them to call. Um, medical issues versus equipment issues, atypical vital signs. Something's just not right with the patient and they know what the norm is. So what is normal? Listen to the caregiver, right? Always deal with what's going on. A, B, C, D, E. Um, I don't think I taught you X, A, B, C, D, E, but whatever. Now today in trauma, we put X in front of the A, B, C, D, E. And X is for exsanguination, major bleeding. So we actually put that first in 
uh, advanced trauma skills that I teach. Uh, so it's now X, A, B, C, D, E. A, airway, uh, this is a tracheostomy, right? It often the, the plastic piece falls out. Uh, this is the stoma, and the tracheostomy goes in there. And um, here, this is what's going on. Uh, if you don't know how to do it, don't put it back in. Uh, they should, the family should have all the replacement parts. These are all different types of airway uh, tracheostomies, trachs. Uh, you got to know what you're doing. Um, nebulized epi, I don't think that's in EMT um, protocols now. Um, but and certainly endotracheal intubation, not something you can do. Uh, respiratory distress, position, suction, oxygen, repeat. So I like that. Position the patient. If they're laying on their back and they're having difficulty breathing, sit them up, right? Remember, sitting up is always better in respiratory problems. Suction, if needs be, okay? If they have mucus, if you hear gurgling, from the mouth, suction, oxygen. And you may need to get someone to change the trick too, right? Uh, you may need to bag them, right? If you take them off a ventilator, make sure you have the BVM ready. Remember that if they're not on the ventilator, you've got to um, ventilate them. So when you deal with, with um, Ventilators, we have a rush table is dope, dope. Um, and the O of dope is obstruction, okay? So you've got to find out if something is blocking the, the ventilator tubing, all right? D would be displacement. It's moved to the wrong place. Uh, o is the uh, obstruction. P would be for pneumothorax. And E is just general equipment failure. So that's called dope. Uh, breathing interventions, always disconnect from the ventilator and bag manually. So one person will bag the patient once every six seconds. The other person will try to troubleshoot the ventilator um, and prepare for transport. Circulation, um, central venous catheters. These are catheters that are going right into a central vein, uh, not a peripheral vein like we do usually in the field. So a lot of people have these, uh, whether they're pick lines or whether they're any of these other lines um, for various reasons, whether sometimes for uh, chemotherapy and sometimes just for other things. So this is the most common one you'll see at home, a PIC line, PIC, P-I-C-C. Um, and whatever, it looks like a peripheral inserted uh, regular IV, but it's actually not. D, disability. So what are your interventions? Position, patient, uh, give IV fluids or whatever. Uh, inotropes, those are drugs that we use to bring up pressure. Uh, again, this is only ALS stuff. Assessment neurological uh, status. Um, neurological status with any patient is key. So how are they acting? Are they acting their usual, their norm? Are they acting completely different? These are all things that, you know, we want to that we really want to know about and we need to know about. So uh, these are important things. Um, CSF shunts, we spoke about those briefly. It's nothing we can do in the field. Um, so yeah, go to the hospital. Um, Shunt could be damaged, disconnected, kinked, all sorts of problems. We can't deal with it. Uh, it can cause brain infection, shunt obstruction, and there can be shunt malfunction, peritonitis, because going down into the abdomen. 
cerebral spinal, oh, we spoke about this, they can vomit, aspirate, you need to suction, give O2, maybe intubate, test blood sugar, everybody test blood sugar and treat for seizures. Okay, so here's how the different shunts work. Uh, one shunts right into the, the ventricle and one shunts into the abdomen. Same sort of idea, same uh, concept. This is an external shunt. E exposure. Um, long board or splint, if you need to move them, whatever. Remember, we take them off long boards and splints on the bus. Um, be careful with the uh, child that has the constant breaking of bones. Um, Osteogenesis imperfecta because just taking up blood pressure could have a problem. Cover the child, no by temperature, respect privacy as usual. Um, they're at high risk for abuse. Um, so NGT is an NG2. Uh, nasogastric goes in through the nose and into the stomach. Uh, some children feed, you know, with this. GT tube goes right in to the stomach surgically. Uh, and these are usually more long-term. Um, there can be lots of complications. Again, obstruction, dislodgement, all sorts of problems. Uh, moving children with special needs is difficult. Where is the primary caregiver? We need the help, all right? What do they do? Obviously, the child will feel better with mom or with the primary caregiver, and really that's very important. Um, it can be very difficult for them to be moved, so keep mom close by. Let them talk to the child, stuff like that. Don't ship mom off in a, you know, a fly car or something. Let them go with um, minimal noise uh, during transport. Child will be anxious, remember? Child being restrained, they may not like that. Uh, don't schlep them. Don't pull on the extremities. Um, always let the mom move the child if you have the option. If it's a possibility, right, put them in a comfortable position um, and don't pull on the extremities again. If they have their own car seat or whatever they usually get transported in, take that. That's the best way. Um, yeah, I don't know about these uh, statistics. Not a fan. Um, Behavioral and emotional needs um, could be something else that really is the underlying cause. Um, and it's very difficult. The, the parents are not going to want to call uh, because of fear, stigma, whatever it is. So you got to be very careful on these calls. Um, you need... You need help, you need the main caregiver, the mother. Um, so we don't really have a way to deal with behavioral issues, uh, but they can have the same thing, like adults, depression, bipolar, schizophrenia, autism, PTSD. Uh, they can have all these just like adults. Considerations. Um, EMS can assist, advocate for the patient, um, but you need the family, you need, you know, um, families, children, psychiatric disorders, uh, competing fears. They love the child, but they can't take the violent outburst. So it becomes like a, a two-way street where they don't know what to do. They, they, they give up, they call us. 